Anjana Shalakaya Jaksuran Militanyena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavane Bio Vaishnavi Bio Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Hatvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasati Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare We welcome everyone to our Bhakti Shastri course on Bhagavad Gita and we're on chapter 18 the final chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, I, I thought we might make use of our time today a little bit to just run over quickly the questions for chapter 18. I see that the questions are a bit dis disjointed. They're not in proper order because what happened, we had originally some questions and it was decided we needed more questions, so they added more questions from different places. And there's also one mistake. If you look at question number 86, oh, 88, 88, it said, explain the significance of the phrase dam yam samvadam, and then they put 18.7. Of course, it's not 18.7. It should be 1870. So you have to correct that in your uh, soft copy, if you have a soft copy or a hard copy in your student book, in the, in the que list of questions, just add a zero onto that seven. So Dharmyam Samvadam comes in text, in question, in text, sloka number 70 of the 18th chapter. Dharmyam Samvadam means a sacred conversation. Hmm? By studying, well, by studying this with our intelligence, we're worshipping Krishna. That's his special significance of this Dharmyam Samvadam. <clears throat> All right, so. I'll just, we'll just go through the questions quickly. List symptoms of renunciation in the mode of passion. Text number six. Anybody? Everyone knows the answer? It's mentioned in text number eight, Maharaj. Oh, text number eight, not six. Sorry, yeah. Thank you, Prima. Text number eight. So symptoms of renunciation in the mode of passion. We give it. We give something up if it's, you know, bodily inconvenience or discomfort. All right. What what are what does it say actually in the verse? Um, Due to those in mode of goodness increase, so this is talking about mode of goodness now. So we have to say, I think it was you were right, six more. Text number eight. Yeah, text number eight, the translation says, for food dear to those in mode of goodness. No, 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 no. So that's wrong. But I think you are right, more of the, the text six. Symptoms of renunciation. This is the Maharaj, this is the one. Anyone who gives a prescribed duty such troublesome or out of fear of bodily discomfort right, is said right. to have renounced right. any so, mode of passion. So out of fear of 
bodily discomfort or because it's troublesome, we renounce it. Right. That's text number six. The mode of passion. Right? And then five causes of the accomplishment of, an act, of all action. We covered that yesterday. Everyone remembers five causes of action? Yes. Yes? You can tell me? The body. Can I say, Maharaj? All right. Yes. The body. Yes. The doer. Hmm? Various senses. India and Super Soul. The body, the, 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 the soul, the Super Soul, the various senses, one missing. Endeavor, right? Endeavor. Did you say endeavor? Hare Krishna? Can you hear me? Um, in Spanish, we can hear you. Mataji, yeah, that's from me. Okay, so that's not a difficult question. We covered that. Three symptoms of happiness in the mode of goodness. We've not covered that yet. We'll come to that today. So we'll leave these three. The, that's a, quite important. Symptoms of happiness in the mode of goodness, and then the mode of passion, and five symptoms of happiness in the mode of ignorance. Then nine qualities of a brahmana, very important. We'll come to that today also. Six symptoms of surrender, we may get there tomorrow. Seventy-nine, this confidential knowledge may never be explained to who, that's coming later. But then, why do the wise, what, what do the wise call giving up the results of all activities? Everyone should know this? Yes? What do the wise call giving up the results of all activities? I don't hear anyone. Uh, anybody want to answer? Can I answer? Yes. I'm waiting for yes. uh, I wrote renunciation, Tiaga. Tiaga, yes, right. That's right, Tiaga. Then three acts which should not be given up even for great souls. Very easy. Uh, yeah, yeah, dana and tapa. Yeah, Prabhu, yes, eh? yeah, yeah, dana and tapa. Yes, right. Yagna, dana and tapa. Very good. Right? And then five characteristics of a worker in the mode of ignorance. We haven't covered that yet. We'll cover it today. Five qualities, each of them that we haven't covered yet today. All right, then coming on. Uh, explain the significance of Krishna being addressed by Arjuna as Keshi Nishudana. Text number one. Arjuna addressed Krishna as Keshi Nishudana. Why? Any hands? Maharaj, because uh, Krishna had killed uh, the demon Keshi, and uh, even uh, Arjuna wants him to kill the like that demon of his doubt. Right, right. Keshi is like the doubts. Doubts. The demons. Doubts are like demons. So Krishna killed the demon Keshi. So Arjuna wants Krishna to kill the doubts in his mind. And then, question 87, explain Krishna's final opinion. That's in text number 6. What is Krishna's final opinion? What, what activities? 
what activity is he talking about? You can't just say like that. You can't just say all these activities. You have to say what activities? The sacrifices for purifying. Yes, yagna dana and tapa. They should be performed without attachment, without any expectation of result, and as a matter of duty. Right? You have to answer carefully when you're answering these questions. You must say, you can't just say all these activities, you have to explain what activities. 88. Explain the significance of Dharma Samvadam. I explained. 89. Explain the analogy of the soldier killing. Everyone should know this. Covered yesterday. Yes? What's the analogy? Just like a, a soldier fighting in the battlefield is doing on the command, on the order of the commander in chief, so, and he does not get any reaction. Similarly, if Arjuna is fighting the battle on uh, the instruction of Krishna, he will not get any reaction for it. Okay, very good. Yes. All right. So. You have to be familiar with these questions and answer them and it will help you in your closed book test. There's a lot of things to be remembered actually. Yeah? Okay, we'll go ahead. We're on text number, I think, 25. We were discussing about the modes of nature, how they affect knowledge, and we heard how the modes of nature influence knowledge, knowledge in goodness, passion and ignorance. Then we heard about action in goodness and passion and ignorance. All right? Now we're going to hear about the next thing, text 26, we'll hear about the worker in the mode of goodness and passion and ignorance. The worker. And this is, one of, this is one of the questions. One of the questions was, uh, what are five qualities of a worker in the mode of ignorance? Five symptoms, or oh, five symptoms of happiness in the mode of ignorance. But there's another question, 28. Five characteristics. This, uh, oh, question number 82. Five characteristics of a worker in the mode of ignorance. So, not very easy to remember all these things. So here we have the worker in the mode of goodness in text number 26. Can everyone see the text? Uh, yes, Maharaj, we can see it. All right. So would someone like to read text number 26? Anybody want to read? Your hands up. Text number 26. One who performs his duty without association with the modes of material nature, without false ego, with great determination and enthusiasm, and without wavering in success or failure, is said to be a worker in the mode of goodness. Now read the next verse, text 27. The worker who is attached to work and the fruits of work, desiring to enjoy those fruits, and who is greedy, always envious, impure, and moved by joy and sorrow, is said to be the mode of passion. Right. And now read 28. The worker who is always engaged in work against the injunctions of the scripture, who is materialistic, obst obstinate, cheating, and expert, sorry, an expert in insulting others who is lazy, always morose, and procrastinating is said to be the more a worker in the mode of ignorance. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. All right. So, twenty-eight. This is one of the questions which is listed here. Five characteristics of the worker in the mode of ignorance. You could say he's always. 
he, he doesn't, doesn't follow the injunction of the scriptures. He's materialistic, obstinate, cheating, expert in insulting others, lazy. <laughs> not, not a very nice person to work with, is it? Always morose and procrastinating. And so, people like that, they're the worker in the mode of ignorance. All right, we'll go ahead. Then text 29 says, O winner of wealth, now please listen as I tell you in detail of the different kinds of understanding and determination according to the three modes of material nature. So understanding and determination are also influenced by the modes of nature. It's not all the same. Determination, of course, is one of the qualities mentioned by Rupa Goswami to advance in devotional service. Utsahan, Nishjiya, Dariyat, enthusiasm, patience, determination. So, but determination is also in the modes. So that you want, of course, as devotees, we are concerned with the mode of goodness. But we should understand these things are also influenced by the modes of nature. All right, someone read text number 30 for us. Okay, go ahead, Rupa. For son of Martha, the understanding by which one knows that ought to be done and what ought not to be done, what is to be feared and what is not to be feared. What is binding and what is liberating is in the mode of goodness. Yeah, it's all son of Prita, not Parta. Parta means the son of Arjun. This is Prita, or son of Prita. So this is Arjun. Read the next verse, Prabhu. 20, 20, 29. Oh, 31. 31. Or son of Prita, the understanding which cannot distinguish between religion and irreligion, between action that should be done and action that should not be done is in the mode of passion. And then 30, 32. The understanding which consider irreligion to be religion and religion to be irreligion under the spell of illusion and darkness and strips always in the wrong direction of Parta is in the mode of ignorance. So you can see the mode of goodness and the mode of ignorance, they're opposites, right? Everything's the opposite. Whatever happens in the mode of goodness, it's the opposite in the mode of ignorance. So understanding is also influenced by the modes. Prabhupada explains in the purport here of text number 32, intelligence in the mode of ignorance is always working the opposite of the way it should. It accepts religion which are not actually religious and rejects actual religion. Men in ignorance understand a great soul to be a common man and accept a common man as a great soul. They think truth to be untruth and accept untruth as truth. In all activities they simply take the wrong path. Therefore, their intelligence is in the mode of ignorance. Okay, we'll go on here about determination. Someone can read.
Mantri, O son of Pritha, that determination which is unbreakable, which is sustained with steadfastness by yoga practice, and which thus controls the activities of the mind, life, and senses in determination in the more of goodness. Yes, can you read 34? Yeah. But that determination by which one holds fast to fruitive results in religion, economic development, and sensible gratification is of the nature of passion, O Arjuna. And then 35? And that determination which cannot go beyond dreaming, fearfulness, lamentation, moroseness, and illusion, such unintelligent determination, O son of Prita, is in the mode of darkness. Thank you. <laughs> we'll read Prabhupada's, I'll read Prabhupada's purport here to 35. It should not be concluded that a person in the mode of goodness does not dream. Here, dream means too much sleep. Dreaming is always present either in the mode of goodness, passion, or ignorance. Dreaming is a natural occurrence. But those who cannot avoid oversleeping, who cannot avoid the pride of enjoying material objects, who are always dreaming of lording it over the material world, and whose life, mind, and senses are thus engaged, are considered to have determination in the mode of ignorance. It's very interesting to understand these, these qualities. You know, we, we, we don't really think of determination in the mode of ignorance, but you can see here from Bhagavad Gita how it's described, that there is such a, a characteristic there. So people who are fearful and who are uh, they sleep too much and they're very proud about material things, always dreaming, lording over the material world. So this is determination and the mode of ignorance. So Lord Krishna is explaining this wonderful thing. The main things you want to know are those things which the questions are referring to. You can't remember everything. Okay, text 36 goes on now to describe about happiness. And this is one of the important things. We should know about happiness in the modes. Text 36. Someone please read. Best of Bharata, Bharatas, now please hear from me about the three kinds of happiness by which the conditioned soul enjoys and by which he sometimes comes to the end of all distress. Yes, go ahead, 37. That which is in the beginning may be just like poison, but at the end is just like nectar and which awakens one to self-realization is said to be happiness in the mode of goodness. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll, we'll just go back to the text 36, the purport here. I'll just read to you what Prabhupada says. Conditioned soul tries to enjoy material happiness again and again. Thus he chews the chewed. But sometimes in the course of such enjoyment, he becomes relieved from material entanglement by association with a great soul. In other words, a conditioned soul is always engaged in some type of sense gratification. But when he understands by good association that it is only a repetition of the same thing, and he is awakened to his real Krishna consciousness, he is sometimes relief from such re repetitive so-called happiness. <laughs> so Prabhupada is explaining the importance of getting the association through association with a devotee, a strong devotee, they can be awakened to Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, <laughs> just material life material entanglement. 
and looking for happiness from the senses, chewing the chewed. So happiness in the mode of goodness is described like poison in the beginning. It's similar to what we learned in the Nectar of Instruction. Rupa Goswami described about the chanting of the holy names of Krishna, how in the beginning it's not very relishable, we don't have a taste for it. We have a saying in Chinese, they say, everything is difficult in the beginning. So certainly it's true, in chanting or reading Srimad Bhagavatam, people find it difficult in the beginning to get a taste for reading these things. It's not so, it takes time. But if one is perseverant, gradually the happiness awakens. Right? Rupa Goswami gives the example about, what's the example he gives in Nectar of Instruction? Do you remember? Jaundice. Right, jaundice, yes. Have you had jaundice before? Yes, man. Yeah, I had it too also. <laughs> Not very pleasant. Anyway, the cure, you have to take the sugar candy, but it's bitter. So, also, happiness in the mode of goodness, in the be beginning it's not so much happiness, it's bitter, it's like poison. Waking up early, taking bath in the morning, going to Mongol Arti, chanting Japa for two hours every morning, it's, these things are like bitter medicine, but they become nectar. Prabhupada says, in the pursuit of self-realization, one has to follow many rules and regulations to control the mind and the senses, and to concentrate the mind on the self. All these procedures are very difficult. Uh, bitter like poison, but if one is successful in following the rules, the regulations, and comes to the transcendental position, he begins to drink the real nectar and he enjoys life. So we hope, we hope it all will come like that, right? You want to taste the nectar, enjoy the real bliss. But the problem is people are more attracted to passion. They think passion is more, more fun, more pleasure. So ha passion is described, happiness in the mode of passion, text number uh, 30, 30, 38, is it? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, that happiness which is derived from contact of the senses with their objects, and which appears like nectar at first, or poison at the end, is said to be of the nature of their passion. <laughs> right. So, that's uh, the, happy, the mode of passion. Of course, we get a lot of passion in relationships with the opposite sex. So, Prabhupada describes in the purport, a young man and a young woman meet. And the senses drive the young man to see her, to touch her, and to have sexual intercourse. In the beginning, this may be very pleasing to the senses. But at the end, or after some time, it becomes just like poison. They are separated, or there is divorce, there is lamentation, there is sorrow, etc. Such happiness is always in the mode of passion. Happiness derived from a combination of the senses and the sense objects is always a cause of distress and should be avoided by all means. So, a good warning is given here. Be very cautious about this kind of happiness. What may start off like so much pleasure will end in disaster. So one has to be very careful 
to remember these teachings. It's not very easy, is it, to apply these kind of teachings? The difficult thing, <laughs> the difficult things are the hardest. So, next verse goes on, text thirty-nine. Yes. One who has uh, thirty-nine translation, and that happiness which is blind to self-realization, which is delusion from beginning to end, and which arises from sleep, laziness, and illusion, is said to be of the nature of ignorance. Okay, so Thank you, if you look at the questions which we have here on the on the student uh, on the student handbook, it's mentioned about they want five symptoms of happiness in the mode of ignorance, three <coughs> three symptoms of happiness in the mode of passion, and three symptoms of happiness in the mode of goodness. So, did you pick out three symptoms from the mode of goodness? Yes. Yes. What are they? At, at the beginning, uh, like position, and the end, like meditation. Yeah. Awaken oneself, uh, self realization. Okay, very good. And what about happiness in the mode of passion? In the mode of passion, at the beginning. And derived from contact of senses. Derived from contact with the senses, right. Okay, good. And now, five symptoms of happiness in the mode of ignorance. Yes? First one, blind to self realization. Yes? Delusion Rises. from beginning to end, right? Arises from uh, sleep, laziness, and illusion. Right. And distress at the start and in the end. <laughs> well, that's not mentioned in the text, in the actual translation. That may be mentioned in the purport, but it's not mentioned in the actual translation. All right. So, Prabhupada says, happiness in the mode of ignorance. Take pleasure in being lazy and in sleeping and darkness. So, the people in the mode of ignorance, they enjoy like this. He said, Prabhupada said, there is no happiness in the beginning or at the end. But of course, they don't think like that. They actually think they're happy. But as far as we are concerned, we think there's, there's no happiness. For the person in the mode of passion, there might be some kind of ephemeral happiness in the beginning and at the end distress. But for the person in the mode of ignorance, only distress, both in the beginning and at the end. So blind to self-realization, delusion from beginning to end, and arises from sleep, laziness, and illusion. So, these kind of things, we have to try to put them in our mind, be able to quote them. Okay, so happiness in the modes of nature was described. We're going to go on to hear more in the next section. Text 40 said, there is no being either here or among the demigods in the higher planetary systems, which is freed from these three modes born of material nature. The Lord here summarizes the total influence of the three modes of material nature all over the universe. So even in the dem planets of the demigods, they're subject to the three modes of nature. Although generally they're in the mode of goodness, but sometimes they also become troubled by the mode of ignorance and the mode of passion. So how powerful the material energy is that can control everyone, even the demigods. Alright, we'll go on to the next section. We're going to hear about 
the different varnas and the different duties in each varna. Because Lord Krishna was describing the modes of nature, so these different varnas are meant for people in different modes. The brahmanas meant to be the mode of goodness. The kshatriya is a mode of passion. And the Vaishya is a mode of passion and ignorance, the Sutra and mode of ignorance, like this. So someone read text 41. Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras are distinguished by the qualities born of their own natures in accordance with the material modes or chastiser of the enemy. Yes. Now read the Brahman qualities. Text 42. Yes, ma'am. Peacefulness, self-control, austerity, purity, tolerance, honesty, knowledge, wisdom and religiousness. These are the natural qualities by which the Brahmanas work. All right. So, Brahmana should be known by these qualities. Qualities like uh, purity. Brahmana is very clean, very pure. Pure in his habits, both internally and externally. Internally, remembering the Lord and thinking of the Lord, and externally, by serving the Lord and chanting the holy name. By taking bath, Brahmana has to take bath regularly, wash the cloth every day. Brahmana, Prabhupada gave the example, because Prabhupada had been a chemist, he'd studied chemistry and he worked in the chem chemical industry for some time, so he gave a chemical uh, equation. He said base plus acid will give salt plus water. In other words, a base mixed with an acid, there will be a reaction. They will, you can't put a base and an acid together and nothing will happen. A reaction will take place. In the same way, when a brahmana contacts a dirty place, they have to clean it. They cannot leave it dirty. Prabhupada gave this example to all of us. He said, a brahmana cannot say, I didn't make the mess, it's not my dirt. The brahmana cannot tolerate to see a place dirty. They have to clean it. Very important. Just like here in Mayapur, you see people come every day, they go to the bank of the Ganga and they leave so much litter, they make such a mess everywhere. So now the devotees have begun a program, they go regularly and clean. They clean up after all these people. It's our duty to take care of the banks of the Ganga. The people come, they, you know, they're not respectful. So we, we try to maintain some purity along the banks of the river Ganga. So cleanliness is important. Another important quality of the Brahmana is truthfulness. Honesty is mentioned, right? Describe honesty or truthfulness. The word is uh, honesty, arjavam. Honesty, arjavam. A brahmana cannot tell a lie. The example was given, Prabhupada told the story about the young boy who wanted to get admission into the school. And so he asked, he went to see the principal of the school to ask him if he could come to the school and take admission in the college, in the school or the ashram. And so the teacher asked him, who's your father? What's your father's name? And the boy said, I don't know. So he said, then go and ask your mother. So the boy went home and asked his mother, what's my father's name? And the mother told her son, I don't know who is your father's name, what your father's name is. I, I don't know. So the boy came back and told the teacher, my mother doesn't know who is my father or what his name is. So when the teacher heard like this, he said, all right, you can come here, you can be admitted as a student. Because the principal understood that this boy is very honest. 
that even though most people would feel ashamed to say that my mother didn't know who my father was, but this boy is so honest, he doesn't hide anything. So he thought, this is a very good quality. So I, we will take him in the school. He has Brahminical qualities, doesn't hide the truth, even though it may be embarrassing and unpleasant for us, but we, we don't hide it. So that's a Brahminical quality. All right, so other qualities are mentioned also, austerity, purity, tolerance, this thing, uh, wisdom, knowledge, religiousness. Of course, a brahmana should also work like a brahmana. Brahmanas are allowed to work, Cer only certain jobs they can do, like worship the deity and teach others to worship the deity. They can teach the scripture and they can study the scripture and they can accept charity, and they can give charity. But it is sometimes remarked that in this Kali Yuga, the Brahmins of Kali Yuga today, they're expert in only one of these six activities. Which one do you think they're expert in? Accepting the charity. Right, right. That's what they're expert. expert in taking the money, accepting the charity. They don't give any charity, they don't worship deities, they don't study Shastra, they just come get the charity, take the money and go. <laughs> right? So, nine qualities, Kshatriya is the head of the society, the head of the social body, he has the biggest responsibility, he should cultivate these qualities. Who is a Brahmana? It's not that you're born with these qualities. Some people may be born with them, may be fortunate, but anybody can be trained as a brahmana if they're properly initiated and trained by a bona fide spiritual master. The, the initiation process should be there, and then after the initiation, the spiritual master wants to instruct the disciple in these different qualifications. He will guide him and help the disciple to cultivate these qualities. Of course, not everybody wants to be a brahmana. That's the thing. All right, we'll go ahead. Next verse, text 43, the Kshatriya. Uh, who wants to do it? Sorry, somebody can go. Okay, Abu uh, Manaya Chai. Abu Translation, heroism, power, determination, resourcefulness, courage in battle, generosity and leadership are the natural qualities of work for Kshetriyas. All right. Seven qualities for the Kshatriya. Seven qualities and in qualities like heroism. They're not cowardly people. They have to be brave. They have to be willing to lead the others and show the example and uh, leadership, right? Leadership, is that Ishwara Bhava, is it? Yes, Ishwara Bhava, yeah. The nature of leadership. Ishwara Bhava, they have that natural ability to control or direct others. They show that a nice example, they're natural leaders. This is the mood of the Kshatriya. A nice example is there that when uh, Maharaj Yudhisthira wanted to perform the Rajasuya sacrifice and they had to, they had to first of all deal with Jarasandha because Jarasandha was the enemy of course. He didn't want Lord Krishna, he didn't want the Pandavas to rule. So Lord Krishna arranged that they would go to see Jarasandha. Lord Krishna along with Bhima and Arjuna, they went to see Jarasandha. But they went disguised as Brahmanas because he knew Jarasandha liked to give charity to Brahmanas. Although Jarasandha was a demon, he liked to give charity to Brahmanas because he knew he got a lot of benefit from that. So Lord Krishna and Arjuna and Bhima all dressed as Brahmanas 
and went to see Jarasandha. So Jarasandha heard Brahmanas have come to get charity. So Jarasandha was very pleased. He came to meet them. But when he was talking to them, he, 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 he understood what kind of Brahmanas are these? Their voices are like thunder. <laughs> you know, Bhima and Arjuna, they're real Kshatriyas, they're Maharatis. So their voices were like thunder when they spoke, you know. They were, and they were so powerful, built. <laughs> so Jarasandha understood this, these people cannot be Brahmanas. But still, he thought, come, they've come as Brahmanas, I should give them charity. So of course the charity they wanted, they wanted a fight. They wanted a duel or to fight with Jarasandha. And Jarasandha fought with Bhima. So anyway, that's the point. The Ishwara Bhav, they have this powerful voice, you know. Some people, they have that power. Just when they speak, oh, you know, you feel so, so overwhelmed, so affected by the power of their authority. So that kind of leadership. And uh, then there also is described uh, courage, resourcefulness, determined power, generosity, right, generosity. And the example is there of Maharaj Janak. Janak Maharaj, he's one of the Mahajans, and he was the father of Mother Sita, who became the wife of Lord Ramachandra, of course. So Janak Maharaj was a Kshatriya, but he was also very generous. He would give so much charity. He would, and he would give to everyone without discrimination. So Kshatriyas are meant to be like that. They're meant to be very generous. That they want to give charity to others. For a Kshatriya, it's an important principle to give charity, to show generosity. In uh, Brihad Bhagavatamrita, we read about Gop Kumar going to a kingdom, and in, the, in this kingdom, the king was a devotee, and the king was doing so much charity. There was so much prasadam distribution for everyone. So that's the nature of a Kshatriya. They like to distribute, they will distribute charity everywhere. A lot of prasadam will be distributed. They, of course, they collect the taxes from the people, and then they use the taxis to distribute, to show charity, to give mercy to everyone. They'll be very generous. They don't, they don't just take the taxis to live comfortably themselves, but they will take taxis to perform sacrifice for the pleasure of the Lord, and then also to give charity. So those seven qualities of a Kshatriya, then text number, 44. Somebody wants to read, please. Please. Yeah, Shamakunda Go ahead. People, farming, co protection, business, are the natural work for the Vaisas. And for the Sudras, they are labor and service to others. Yes, so the Vaishya, we had nine qualities for the Brahman, seven qualities for the Kshatriya. There are three mentioned here for the Vaishya, farming, cow protection, and business. So this is a Vaishya, the Vaishyas. You, you see, initially the Vedic system was the Brahmana was the head. But the Brahmana, somehow they became corrupted and degraded. And then the Kshatriyas took over. But the Kshatriyas, without the Brahmins there to guide them, they were also corrupted and degraded. So then the Vaishyas took over. And you got businessmen, different businessmen, politicians there who become prominent, like in America. These people who are all in politics there, they're all very wealthy people, people with a lot of money. But Politicians can also be corrupted, and that's why you have things like communism coming. Communism is the movement of the sudras. The sudras become the leaders of the society. So, like that. 
the Vedic system fell apart and you, you end up with sudras running the country and Vaishyas and they're fight, two are fighting with each other. So Vaishyas anyway, they're meant to do farming or cow protection and business. Farming and cow protection are the most pious of all of occupations. And Lord Krishna himself, of course, came in the family of Nanda Maharaj to show all of us the importance of taking care of the cows. Lord Krishna, he carries the flute to call the cows. And Lord Balaram, he carries the plough. Lord Balaram's doing the farming and Krishna's doing the cow protection. And the sudras, for the sudras, they are they do labor and service to others. That's their duty. Sudras don't know what to do. They don't have a much brain. They're not very active to think what I should do. They have to be told what to do. So the sudras just take instruction from others. So in the Kali Yuga, it said, Kalo Sudra Sambhavaha. Everyone is a sudra or lower. By birth, we're Sudra or Lord, but we can be reborn, we can be upgraded. Also, in this way, the qualities of the four Varnas are described. So, sometimes we see a Brahmana become a Kshatriya, and sometimes we Kshatriya become a Brahmana. Right? Do you remember? Can you give the example? Who was the Kshatriya who became a Brahmana? Vishwamitra Muni. right. And who was the Brahmana who became Kshatriya? Parashurama. Right. Okay. Yes. So, we practice Daiviva Nashram. We, we, we have to do all these different duties. We may be Brahmins, but we have to also sometimes, we have to do work, we have to may do farming, we may have to give management, organize, lead. And so, Devi Vanasha. Then text 45 goes on. Please read text 45. Yeah, by following his qualities of work, every man can become perfect. Now, please hear from me how this can be done. All right, how it can be done, how we can become perfect. Next verse, please read Prabhu, carry on. By worship of the Lord, who is the source of all beings and who is all pervading, a man can attain perfection through performing his own work. All right, very important verse that man can, a man can attain perfection through performing his own work. And you can see that from this kind of verse, people come up with things like, they say, work is worship. Through performing his own work, a man can attain perfection. So they may think like that. They think the work I'm doing is worship. So Prabhupada explains in the purport, the second paragraph, everyone should think, that he is engaged in a particular type of occupation by Rishikesh, the master of the senses. And by the result of the work in which one is engaged, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, should be worshipped. If one thinks always in this way, in full Krishna consciousness, then by the grace of the Lord, he becomes fully aware of everything. That is the perfection of life. The Lord says in Bhagavad Gita 12.7, Tesha Maham Samudartha, the Supreme Lord Himself takes charge of delivering such a devotee. That is the highest perfection of life. In whatever occupation one may be engaged, if he serves the Supreme Lord, he will achieve the highest perfection. So it's not that we just simply work, but we have to have the consciousness that we're working on behalf of the Lord, 
that we're doing this service for Krishna. We have to, as Prabhupada says, we have to work in Krishna consciousness, in full Krishna consciousness. It means always thinking of Krishna and remembering Krishna as a master, we are his servant. At least we are trying to become his servant. Not very easy thing to become the servant of the Lord. We are trying. So we shouldn't uh, concoct some bogus philosophy that simply work and it's all worship. <laughs> no, there must be consciousness, the conscious, the, the proper mood, the proper attitude that I'm doing this on behalf of Krishna. And the fruit is for Krishna also. Okay, text 47. Yes, somebody want to read? Okay. Yes, Sri Chandra, you want to Text 47. It is better to engage in one's own occupation, even though one may perform it imperfectly, than to accept another's occupation and perform it perfectly. Duties prescribed according to one's nature are never affected by sinful reactions. Okay, so we may think, <laughs> we may think I don't like this job, I want to do the other job. We may think, Prabhupada in the purport gives some little bit uh, example about it. He says uh, in the first paragraph, halfway through, in this way one should work according to his own nature. No work is abominable if performed in the service of the Supreme Lord. The occupational duty of a brahmana is certainly in the mode of goodness. But if a person is not by nature in the mode of goodness, he should not imitate the occupational duty of a brahmana. For a kshatriya or administrator, there are so many abominable things. A kshatriya has to be violent, to kill his enemies, and sometimes a kshatriya has to tell lies for the sake of diplomacy. Such violence and duplicity accompany political affairs. But a kshatriya is not supposed to give up his occupational duty and try to perform the duties of a brahmana. Uh, just like Brahmana, he may also have to do some unpleasant things, just like sometimes a Brahmana may do the animal sacrifice, so that kind of thing, not very pleasant, not recommended. And similarly in business, if you're, a, if you're doing business, you have to be able to tell lies. Hmm? Prabhupada said, Therefore, it should be taken as a simple, it should be taken as a simple lie if a merchant says that he is not making a profit. But the merchant should not think that because he is engaged in an occupation in which the telling of lies is compulsory, he should give up his profession and pursue the profession of a brahmana. That is not recommended. Whether one is kshatriya, or Vaishya, or a Sudra, doesn't matter. If he serves by his work, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Even Brahmanas who perform different types of sacrifice sometimes must kill animals. There's a, there's a story, there's a pastime about Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur. He tells that when he was a young man, he was given a job working in a store. And he was working in this store. Uh, so it happened, the cus one customer came in and purchased something. And Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur was serving him and he gave him change. But he made a mistake. He didn't give enough change. The change was less than what should have been there. So the man took the change, didn't say anything, didn't notice and went away. 
But then Bhakti Nod, he himself noticed that he'd given the wrong change. And he felt very guilty and he went after the man, found the man and gave the man more change. So the owner of the shop came to Bhakti Vinod Thakur and told him, you should not work here. You're too honest. <laughs> You're too honest to work here. The shopkeeper has to be able to lie and sometimes make mistakes like this for his own benefit. So you have to be very... <laughs> to be a shopkeeper, you have to be willing to be a little dishonest. So Prabhupada saying like that about the Vaishya, you have to be able to say, yeah, for you no profit. So text 48, uh, 48 gives an example, right? In 48. We didn't read 48 yet, did we? Not much. Did yeah, someone read? Yes. Yeah. Okay, bro. Yeah. Text 48, translation. Every endeavor is covered by some fault, just as fire is covered by smoke. Therefore, one should not give up the work warm of his nature. So Krishna is giving an example here to explain about faults. He said, just like a fire, there's going to be some smoke. So every endeavor is covered by some kind of fault. You light a fire, you can't expect to make a fire immediately blazing flames. There's going to be some smoke in the beginning. So similarly, uh, it's mentioned here that uh, every endeavor there will be some fault. So we cannot expect that we'll, that we'll find some work, we can do some work without some fault. And Prabhupada talks about the Brahmana, sometimes he has to kill an animal, a Kshatriya may be very pious but he may have to fight his enemies cannot avoid it. The merchant also, he cannot be so honest. Sometimes he will have to lie and cheat to make some profit. Sometimes he will do black market also. These kind of things cannot be avoided. You're a Vaishya, businessman, you can't expect to avoid all of this. Even though a man is a Sudra, serving a bad master, he has to carry out the order of the master, even though it should not be done, right? You have to, maybe you're working for some man, he tells you to go and do something which is really not proper, but you work for him, you have to do it. So that's the nature of the material world, there's going to be some faults. So that's one question there in the student handbook. Mm. Explain the analogy of the fire covered by smoke. Text, that's question number 90. Okay, we'll go ahead. Text 49. Can I continue? Yes, yes. Self-control and unattached, and who disregards all material enjoyments, can obtain by practice of renunciation the highest perfect stage of freedom from reaction. Oh, okay. One who is self-controlled and unattached, disregards all material enjoyments, can obtain by practice of renunciation the stage of perfection. So what is that stage? What is that stage of perfection? Let's read Prabhupada's purport. Real renunciation means that one should always think himself part and parcel of the Lord. And therefore, 
think that he has no right to enjoy the results of his work. Since he is part and parcel of the Supreme Lord, the results of his work must be enjoyed by the Supreme Lord. This is actually Krishna Consciousness. The person acting in Krishna Consciousness is really a sannyasi, one in the renounced order of life. By such a mentality, one is, situate, one is satisfied because he is actually acting for the Supreme. Thus he is not attached to anything material. He becomes accustomed to not taking pleasure in anything beyond the transcendental happiness derived from the service of the Lord. So like Prabhupada explains this verse in a very Krishna conscious manner, actually it's the verse itself, word spoken by Krishna is not so much Krishna conscious, but Prabhupada puts it into a Krishna conscious manner. All right. Uh, we need to have a look at the. Uh, we'll have a look at the PowerPoint presentation, just to just to see what's going on here. Go back to the par. Let's see. All right, we're up to. Uh, we went through the entanglement of the three modes, number three, and then forty-one to forty-eight. Worship the Lord through one's occupational work. That was described, the different varnas, the duties which we have to perform in each of the varnas. This is true renunciation and brings freedom from reaction. Are you able to see this text? The slides? Yes, yes, yes. yes Okay. Okay, so that takes us up to 48, that to get freedom from reactions, Nishkam Karma Yoga, and then we're coming to this section number five, from Jnana Yoga to pure devotional service, described in text 49 to 55. Jnana Yoga to pure devotional service. All right, we'll go on, come back to Bhagavad Gita. All right, so text number number 50. Someone can read? Uh, yes, Guruji. Uh, I have a question to uh, Okay, let's have some questions, yeah. Okay, uh, regarding that verse in which it was like mentioned, it's like given reason one's own occupation, even though one needs to perform things perfectly. Just try to understand it in a better way. Uh, when he's having some, if finding some faults in his occupation, uh, why not he can uh, like stay in such a good as he's doing it for Krishna's service? Like, um, if he's not feeling satisfied in his occupation and in service, and then why can't he like to talk to the authorities and like seek his over? Well. He may, he may be satisfied, but he just may not be able to do the occupation very well. He may just may not have very much ability to perform the occupation, but he himself may be quite happy to do the work. But he just may not do it as best as, as well as others. Like, how, the, how does it apply to in, in general if one's out? If it's in case like devotees do have multi talents and like in uh, nature, 
They're not feeling satisfied in themselves. They generally talk to the authority and then they, uh, with discussions, there's a, either, either their service gets changed or something like that it generally happens in Wisconsin society. I mean, yeah, is this was particularly speaking of one ashrama or it's like only applied to the uh, other things also? Well, it's speaking about prescribed duties that everyone has a particular nature, their psychophysical nature, and they should understand what is actually the best kind of engagement for them. You know, somebody by nature, they have that, they're, they're very controlling and bossy, you know. <laughs> Maybe they're meant to be a Kshatriya. And someone else, their nature is more to study and they're very frugal and they're very clean and pure, like that Brahminical. So according to the psychophysical nature, one has a particular occupation or situation in the Varnashram, and one should follow that. And by performing one's duty in these different Varnas, one can achieve perfection. If we do it in consciousness of Krishna, consciousness of the Lord. It's not just do the duty, not just do the duty only. But we have to, we have to at the same time be conscious of the Lord, that we're working for Him. So Varnashram is like stepping stones into uh, spiritual consciousness. It will help us to come. You know, you follow the duties of Varnashram, you have particular duties, particular work to do. You do that work, it will help you to advance. You do things but like carpet. Speak of one ashram. I mean, uh, why it fell apart in uh, the current society? Uh, one of the reasons was that uh, Krishna was not the center, the Supreme Lord was not the center, and this knowledge was not given by uh, in a proper way. Like, you have to do work for the satisfaction. Ultimately, it all uh, came down to sense gratification, and then. Uh, fell apart because these rules and regulations were not seen in a proper way. And then uh, if we uh, try to see uh, the Varnashram uh, applied inside ISKCON or inside any devotional institute, then the dynamics completely changes. Well, we are following Daivi Varnashram, you know, we're not following the traditional Vedic Varnashram because so here, here in these verses, what is the talk going on? It's like talking on of the traditional Vedi Varnashram or it, the uh, Daivi Varnashram? Usually they're talking of the Vedic Varnashram. Yeah, but, but in purport, like Prabhupada seems to be talking sometimes of Daivi Varnashram. Yes, right. And the purport is different. But in the text, certainly in the text, it's Vedic Varnashram. Shruti Madhani, you got a question? Shruti Madhani? Yes. Sir, Prabhupada, I have a question. Is it okay to ask right now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Speak up. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, actually there was a shlok 3.35 and now 18.47, so I got confused in both. Okay. 18.47. Better to do one's duty and not do another's duty, right? Yes, Maharaj, and 3.35. Then to perform another duty. And that 3.35 is the same thing. Okay. So both are explaining the same thing, Maharaj? Yeah, the, the point is that we should recognize what is our particular duty and we shouldn't take another person's duty. You shouldn't, you know, you want to do another person's service, we should do what is the service which was meant for us. If you accept another's, do someone else's occupation, you know, we see people do things like, 
you know, probably, maybe they have some land and they should be farmers and they should be farming, but instead they go off to the factory and they work in the factory and become a sudra. They take up a job as a worker in the factory or somewhere on the plantation somewhere and they leave their own land. They don't take care of their own land. They're actually, they have land, but they're not taking the time or the trouble to cultivate the land and they go off and work somewhere else to get a salary. So this is not really how it's meant to be. We're meant to recognize what's our duty. Similarly, the brahmana, the brahmana may be, he's, he's given the position as a priest in the temple, but there's more attraction. If he, if he goes and works in the company, they'll pay him more money. He gets a much bigger salary. So many brahmanas, they left the worship of the Lord to go and become sudras and to work in the multinational corporation. So this is not how it's meant to be. They, they gave up their caste. They became sudras to go and work in the, in the office or in the big building rather than worship the deity, which is what they were meant to be doing, which was really what, what their duty was their qualification, but they give it up to, to go and do that kind of thing. So, duties prescribed according to one's nature are never affected by sinful reactions, right? If they do what was their nature, if they stay to worship the deity, they're safe. But when you go and work in a multinational corporation, you work in the big office, and you give up what you're supposed to be doing, then you're going to get sinful reactions. Because you gave up your duty. You gave up what you were supposed to do. You left your duty. Uh, regarding this thing, uh, may I just like, ask a bit? Okay. What you right now said. Like if, if one is a Brahmana, he's, he's, uh, he's uh, by nature. Uh, so how is it that he is getting attracted to the high paid or the salaried employer? And if he's having the nature of a Brahmana, then it seems that he would not be attracted to the other field itself. But if he's not in a, uh, situated in a proper nature, if he's, he's like uh, he's not the proper Brahmana, he doesn't have the nature of Brahmana. Then it may be the case that he's attracted to other fields and other. So what is wrong if he's not having the, that nature to go to the other field, other activities? No, the point is that he is a Brahmin. He, he somehow he, he has that maybe born in a Brahmana family and he's raised, maybe his father also had been a priest in the temple and was worshipping the deity and as a young child he would go there to the temple, he would see the deity and so on. But somehow he went to college, he went to school, got education and so many other people, they all went off to into the business world to work. They took the jobs in the big offices and so he also thought, oh, I also want to do that. Why I should just stay in the temple and just sit in the temple all day and hardly make any money. Better I should also go and get the money. By association, he becomes polluted, becomes contaminated, develops that material interest. Actually, his nature is to be Brahman, but so because of association, because of the materialistic environment, he becomes attracted and he leaves the culture, leaves behind the culture and goes off to the sit in the office. So like if you go to the root, I mean if one is uh, an initial Brahman, first of all, the gender can be easily changed by association. What? Can't can hear you. The nature can be easily changed by association. Like uh, the nature can be easily changed by association. Yes. Yes, nature is changed by association, the environment wherein people become affected, they become polluted by it. But we said anyone can become a Brahmana if they're properly trained and initi initiated and trained, they can become a Brahmana. So this per 
pe some people, we see a lot of people, they, they ha they, they're brahmanas by birth, but they're not working like brahmins. They're not doing what the brahmins are supposed to do. But they still claim, I'm brahmin, we're brahmins. But they don't do the work of the brahmin. What is the, what is the good to be a brahmin? You're not working like a brahmin. So this is the point, that they give up the nature, they give up what, what they, the, the, the opportunity which they actually had, they leave it behind. They want to become doctors or something, they want to become politicians or something, I don't know, rather than be a Brahmin. So, to, to give up one's duty, to give up one's occupation, it, it, you, you get sinful reactions when you go away from your actual nature. You're put into a materialistic environment, you have to associate in a materialistic atmosphere and there will be a lot of sinful reactions. You may get more money. You get more material money, more money for your sense gratification, and, and what, what will happen? Who will get the money? The doctors and the lawyers, so many other people, they'll get the money. You, you you're, you're thinking, I've got more money, but you've got more problems also. You have legal expenses and you have medical expenses. And you're not getting the benefit, the spiritual benefit which you are getting when you are doing your own work. Just like the farmer, you work in the fields, it's very healthy, very pious. But you go and work in the factory, it's not pious, it's not healthy. This is the sinful reactions, you suffer from the atmosphere. When Prabhupada in the purport, you can see to that verse which you referred to, 47, Prabhupada says, one should act to satisfy the Supreme Lord. When nobody's thinking like that, nobody's thinking they want to satisfy Krishna, they want to please the Lord, they simply think about their own sense gratification. I want, I want, I need, I am more, I need more. But if you thought about satisfying the Lord, then there would be a different thing. And Prabhupada gives the example about Arjuna. He, he, had, he fought because he wanted to please Krishna. So this should be the point. Prabhupada says, in the business field also, Brahmanas, oh, or in the business field also, sometimes a merchant has to tell lies to make a profit. If he does not do so, there can be no profit. Oh, okay. But if such fighting is performed for the sake of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, there need be no fear of degradation. And even the businessman who is telling lies, he should know that without profit the merchant cannot exist. Therefore, it should be taken as a simple lie if a merchant says that he is not making a profit. But the merchant should not think that because he is engaged in an occupation in which the telling of lies is compulsory, he should give up his profession and per pursue the profession of a brahmana. That is not recommended. Whether one is Kshatriya, Vaishya or Sudra doesn't matter if he serves by his work, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even Brahmana, who perform different types of sacrifice, sometimes must kill animals. Anyway, the, the point is, we have to satisfy Krishna, try to please Krishna. That is Krishna consciousness, when you're thinking how to please Krishna. On, it, Prabhupada also refers to the third chapter. He says in the third chapter, 
These matters have been clearly and elaborately explained. Every man should work for the purpose of Yajna or for Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Anything done for personal sense gratification is a cause of bondage. They should be engaged in the particular mode of nature he has acquired and he should decide to work only to serve the Supreme Cause. So the particular mode of nature they have acquired. We should recognize we've acquired a particular nature. Okay, somebody, they give up the Brahman nature and go and work in the office. So they're no longer Brahman. But they claim, no, I'm Brahman. We're Brahmins, we're Brahmins. This is the illusion. They want to enjoy the Brahminical status, but they don't want to work like a Brahmin. So this is a fault. So one's meant to perform the duty according to his psychophysical nature. Maharaj, uh, uh, may I just ask a Yes. Yes. No, uh, trying to find out one psychophysical nature, it's like not a very easy task. Um, as you, as you uh, said that, I mean, if one goes to school and college, the nature does get changes. But these days it's very, very difficult to find out one's own nature. So, uh, like, what is prescribed in this and that sort of thing? Because uh, if you're in a certain environment, um, um, currently you're going to be living in this mother world, it's very, very flickering uh, thing, the nature gets changed very easily by the association and the desires also get very easily changed by the association. So the real uh, nature of one's heart, I feel it gets revealed by the devotion service only and it takes quite a lot of time uh, the, to find out the real nature. That's why one should actually have a spiritual master. The spiritual master, he, he observes the person. And he can understand what is the psychophysical nature of the person. And just like one's parents, you know, one's parents, they also know the psychophysical nature of their child. And they can understand when the girl or the boy is ready for marriage, they can arrange the suitable person and they know what, what kind of person will make a good partner for them. They can understand the mind. So the parents know. In the same way, the spiritual master understands the psychophysical nature and he can properly direct the person. He knows, you know, who has to take a job, go and work in the industry. He knows who can do business. He knows who can be a Brahman. Now, sometimes we had some people, we had like one, one person, he was trying to worship the deity. So he was supposed to perform the arti. So the arti was supposed to take 25 minutes. But he did the arti in two minutes. The whole arti in two minutes. It was amazing. <laughs> you know, he just didn't have the Brahminical nature. He thought, you know, nobody's watching me. And he would just go on the, go on the altar. He blow the conch shell and two minutes later he'd blow the conch shell again. That was the end of the arti. And we say, hey, just a minute, you know, this is not right. But his nature was just not like that. He just couldn't stand there and worship the deity. But someone else, they can stand there and worship the deity every day. And they're very happy, very, they feel bliss to do it. They do it out of duty for the service of the Lord. Just like cooking, you know, some ladies, they'll cook and they're, they're very happy to cook. They'll cook for hours. And some people, oh no, cooking, oh no, go and purchase, go and buy outside. <laughs> they don't want to cook. And so, people have different natures. So one should recognize what particular nature we have. It should, we should be guided by spiritual authorities and they can properly direct us.
after this, brought out in text 48, one should not give up work born of his own nature, even if such work is full of fault. So it may be like we do something in the faults, we do faults, we say, well, I'm not doing it, I can't do it right. But if we keep practicing, keep doing it, gradually it will become right. You can correct the faults. In the beginning there's faults, just like cooking. In the beginning, Prabhupada says, cooking is practice. In the beginning, you may not cook very well, but if you keep practicing, keep cooking, it will become better and better. Okay? We'll go ahead. Uh, we're up to text number 50. O son of Kunti, learn from me how one who has achieved this perfection can attain to the supreme perfectional stage, Brahman, the stage of highest knowledge, by acting in the way I shall now summarize. So Lord Krishna is describing, come to, come to the supreme perfectional stage, Brahman, Right? We're going to hear later about devotional service. So we haven't heard about devotional service yet. This is coming to Vajjana Yoga, coming to the Brahman. One attains the supreme, the supreme stage of Brahman simply by renouncing the results of his work for the satisfaction of the Supreme Lord. That is the process of self-realization. The actual perfection of knowledge is in attaining pure Krishna consciousness. That is described in the following verses. So the actual perfection of knowledge is in attaining pure Krishna consciousness. That's going to be described. But first coming to the level of Brahman. So these next verses describe about coming to the level of Brahman, 51 to 53. Being purified by his intelligence and controlling the mind with determination, giving up the objects of sense gratification, being freed from attachment and hatred, one who lives in a secluded place, who eats little, who controls his body, mind and power of speech, who is always in trance and who is detached, free from false ego, false strength, false pride, lust, anger and acceptance of material things, free from false proprietorship and peaceful, such a person is certainly elevated to the position of self-realization. All right, so by hearing these different qualities we can understand, you know, such a person has to be, you know, he has to be a yogi, he has to be detached from the body, he has to really be in the mode of goodness. Prabhupada explains in the purport, when one is purified by intelligence, he keeps himself in the mode of goodness. We, we see again and again, the mode of goodness is being em, em, st stressed on us, the importance of this, the mode of goodness. So to come to the mode of goodness, you have, we have to purify the intelligence. That purification comes about by practice of spiritual principles, by hearing, by chanting. Thus one becomes the controller of the mind and is always in trance. He is not attached to the objects of sense gratification, free from attachment and hatred in the activities. Such a detached person naturally prefers to live in a secluded place. He does not eat more than what he requires and he controls the activities of his body and mind. He has no false ego 
because he does not accept the body as himself, nor has he a desire to make the body fat and strong by accepting so many material things. Because he has no bodily concept of life, he is not falsely proud. He is satisfied with everything that is offered to him by the grace of the Lord. And he is never angry in the absence of sense gratification. Nor does he endeavor to inquire, to acquire sense objects. Thus, when he is completely free from false ego, he becomes non-attached to all material things. And that is the stage of self-realization of Brahman. That stage is called the Brahma-Buddha stage. When one is free from the material conception of life, he becomes peaceful and cannot be agitated. This is described in Bhagavad Gita. Apuryamana machala pratishtam samudram apa pravishanti yadvat tadvat kamayam pravishanti sarve sashamtim apnoti nakama kami. A person who is not disturbed by the incessant flow of desires that enter like rivers into the ocean, which is ever being filled, but is always still, can alone achieve peace and not the man who strives to satisfy such desires. All right, so in this way, coming to the level of Brahman is being described. Different qualities which one should acquire. If he's actually on the level of Brahman, we should see these, these kind of qualities, these different symptoms exhibited. Being peaceful, undisturbed, not agitated, very calm, relaxed, not in control of the mind and senses. That's the main point, right? So we've heard from the beginning of the 18th chapter, we heard first karma yoga and then jnana yoga. And then from jnana yoga, we heard about the different influences of the modes of nature. And we have to transcend the modes of nature. And we can transcend the modes of nature by working doing the proper work, which the work which we're meant to do, what's prescribed for us. And now we're hearing coming to the level of Brahman. And then verse 54, which is an important verse, a well-known verse, describes the qualities of one on the level of Brahman and how they can begin devotional service. Right? Brahma Buddha Prasanatma. One who has actually come to the level of Brahman he will be a joyful soul. Srila Prabhupada was very much concerned to see that the devotees should be happy, they should be peaceful in mind, they should be joyful, they should not be morose. Prabhupada had one servant and Prabhupada noticed how morose he was. He told him, you cannot be in Krishna consciousness if you are morose. If you get angry, you're not peaceful, you're not calm, you're not joyful, this is not Krishna consciousness. It means you're not even on the Brahman. One who is Brahman is Prasanatma. And then Nashochati Nakanchati. They don't hanker for anything, you don't lament anything. Samasarveshu Bhutishu, you see all living entities equally. Madbhakti Labhate Param. In this way, you can begin devotional service. He takes up devotional service. All right. Any questions? There's a long purport on 54. Huh. Any more questions before we go on? Just one small thing, Maharaj. So coming to the level of Brahman is I mean, like different from coming to the level of uh, uh, goodness. It's more higher, just to clarify. It's like coming to the pure goodness. Yes, Brahman is transcendental. Brahman is the transcendental platform. If you've come to the level of Brahman, you've transcended the modes of nature. 
If you're in the mode of goodness, you're still in the modes. And mode of goodness can be influenced by passion and ignorance any time. So you're not transcendentally situated. But on the platform of Brahman, you're transcendental. Even the impersonalists who come to the Brahman, they're transcendentalists. They've, come, they've transcended the modes of nature. So Brahman is higher than the mode of goodness. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So Maharaj, uh, here this is like a uh, Gyani, so, uh, so the Lord is telling that Gyanis who come to this Brahman stage, they can start the devotional service. So can we connect it to, connect it to that verse where uh, the Lord says, uh, after many, many births, the one who is in knowledge comes to my devotion service. So can these two be linked? Uh, uh, yes, yes, you can see that the, after many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto me. So, uh, that, that, that verse shows us that the, by the process of gyan, you make advancement slowly, right? By the process of gyan, by just simply taking the path of knowledge, you're going to make progress slowly. It's going to take a long time. It takes many births. Here, this is summarizing. This is, this is summarizing. So, coming to the platform of Brahman, right? But we have to go on from the platform of Brahman, right? We want people to go on. The gyani. He knows, he, if he knows Vasudev Sarvamiti, that is devotional service. He's come to the level of devotion. But it takes them a long, it takes them a long time by the path of knowledge. The Gyani, the Gyani he may have, trend, he's already come to the level of Brahman and then he goes on from the level of Brahman to know Vasudev Sarvamiti. So there's similar verses, right? Similar. So Maharaj, like see, the Gyanis mostly they go for in person Brahman. So that means that uh, they come again and they, after many, many words like that, then they take up devotion service. Is it like. Well, they may not take up devotional service. They may go back to the material life. They may go back to material welfare activities. Right? Avishuddha Buddha Ya. Srimad Bhagavatam says, their intelligence is not yet fully purified. So they may go back again to the material world and take up welfare activities, perform acts, social services, because they don't know about spiritual activities. They don't know actually about devotional service unless they get the mercy of a devotee. Unless some devotee is able to enlighten them about the importance of devotional service and Krishna consciousness, they won't take up devotional service. They'll simply remain jnanis and then go back to the material world. And as a jnani, they're simply relishing only that their happiness is just mukti. They think the goal of life is liberation, just to become one, to merge. So there's no happiness, there's no real pleasure on that level. <coughs> Therefore, they come back to the material world and take up activities again on the material, pla on the bodily platform. Because they don't know about proper spiritual activities. Which, are, which is devotional service. They're not able to... Huh? They, they simply, for them, they simply think the goal is merging, becoming one, or negation, negation of desire, stop everything. So they want to negate everything, so they stop everything. So everything stopped, and they stop activities, no activity, no variety, no relationships, no pleasure, and they come back to the material world. Because there's no happiness, there's no satisfaction there. 
Can you hear me okay? Yes? So we have to be careful. You know, the jnanis, they're transcendentalists, but their, their destination is just the impersonal Brahman. And usually what happens from the impersonal Brahman, they go back to the material world. It's rare that somebody from the Brahman will come become a devotee. We have Sukadeva Goswami and the four Kumaras. They were, they were drawn to the impersonalist, but they became devotees. But that's rare. Most Brahmagyanis, most Vedantas and Gyanis, they're speculators and they go back to the material world. You know, these people who are all jnanis and mental speculators, what do they do? They simply encourage uh, welfare activities and they don't, you know, they don't have real devotional service. They may speak about devotional service, but they think the goal of devotional service is merging. And they think once they become merged, then they give up all activities, they stop everything. So they come back to the material platform. So, so we're trying to preach the message of Lord Chaitanya, which is cha defeating this impersonalism and voidism. So, but coming to the Brahma Buddha stage, it's, it's an advanced level. You know, they're advanced, they're detached from sense gratification. They've given up all thought of sense gratification, material sense gratification. They have no material desires. They see the soul within everyone. They respect all living entities. So this is Brahma Buddha. They're joyful, they're happy. There's some happiness here, but that happiness is very small compared to the happiness of devotional service. The happiness from devotional service is like an ocean compared to the drop of happiness from the Brahman. Right? The happiness of Brahman is very insignificant compared to the happiness of devotional service. We can just read a little bit from the purport. Prabhupada does speak a, a, quite a bit about the impersonalist philosophy here in the purport. It's, a, it's a, an important purport. It's good to go through it. To the impersonalist, achieving the Brahma Bhutta stage, becoming one with the Absolute, is the last word. But for the personalist or pure devotee, one has to go still further to become engaged in pure devotional service. This means that one who is engaged in pure devotional service to the Supreme Lord is already in a state of liberation called Brahma Bhutta, oneness with the Absolute. Without being one with the Supreme, the Absolute, one cannot render service unto Him. In the Absolute conception, there is no difference between the served and the servitor, yet the distinction is there in a higher spiritual sense. So Srila Prabhupada is describing about the impersonalists, their goal is mukti. They think that's it, that's perfection. Of course, they have to work very hard to get liberation, but for a devotee in Krishna consciousness, very quickly we can come to that level. Very quickly a devotee is brought to that stage of mukti and begins devotional service. It doesn't take hardly any time in bhakti yoga. We say bhakti yoga is like taking the lift up. These jnanis, they walk up the stairs. In the material concept of life, when one works for sense gratification, there is misery. But in the absolute world, when one is engaged in pure devotional service, there's no misery. Devotee in Krishna consciousness is nothing for which to lament or desire. Since God is full, a living entity who is engaged in God's service in Krishna consciousness 
becomes also full in himself. He is just like a river cleansed of all dirty water. Because a pure devotee has no thought other than Krishna, he is naturally always joyful. He does not lament for any material loss or aspire for gain because he is full in the service of the Lord. He has no desire for material enjoyment because he knows that every living entity is a fragmental part and parcel of the Supreme Lord and therefore eternally a servant. He does not see in the material world someone is higher and someone is lower. Higher and lower positions are ephemeral and a devotee has nothing to do with ephemeral appearances or disappearances. For him, stone and gold are of equal value. This is the Brahma Buddha stage and this stage is attained very easily by the pure devotee. In that stage of existence, the idea of becoming one with the Supreme Brahman and annihilating one's individuality becomes hellish. The idea of attaining the heavenly planets becomes phantasmagoria and the senses are like serpents whose poisoned teeth are, poisoned teeth are broken. As there is no fear of a serpent with broken teeth, there is no fear from the senses when they are automatically controlled. The word, the world is miserable for the materially infected person. But for a devotee, the entire world is as good as Vaikuntha or the spiritual world. The highest personality in this material universe is no more significant than an ant for a devotee. Such a stage can be achieved by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, who preached pure devotional service in this age. So very clear purport, Prabhupada is explaining to us the defects of the impersonal philosophy and the great advantage of the Krishna conscious philosophy. You see, all the realizations of the impersonalists, they're all there for the devotee. And devotee is always joyful because he's remembering Krishna and devotee has no material desires. So his senses don't trouble him. Prabhupada gives the example about the serpents whose teeth are broken. And so the senses are like that for the devotee. Devotee is not troubled by his senses because he is fully engaged in Krishna's service. He doesn't think about sense gratification. There's no fear from the senses because his, his only thought is to use the senses for Krishna. All right, any questions? This is the level of Brahman. We'll go on and you'll see in the rest of the chapter, Krishna talks about coming to the, after Brahman, coming to Paramatma and then Bhagavan. We'll hear the different levels of real life. There's confidential knowledge, more confidential knowledge and most confidential knowledge all going to be described. Actually, this level of Brahman, we could call this confidential knowledge. It's not everybody knows about it. But then we'll hear more confidential knowledge and then most confidential knowledge. Are there any questions? Anyone? Anybody have any questions? Maharaj, um, we are calling the impersonalist as transcendentalist, but are they not in illusion or ignorance to say that the Lord does not have form? Well, if we speak about Brahma Gyanis, Brahma don't say the Lord doesn't have form. They just say that the Absolute is, you know, they just come to the platform of Brahman. It's not that they blaspheme, they don't commit any offence, they just haven't talked about, they haven't understood that it's an absolute or that there's a supreme personality of Godhead. They simply think of the 
the spiritual existence, the spiritual realm, the Brahman, like the four Kumaras and Sukadeva Goswami. They were fixed on the platform of Brahman. They didn't deny that there's a Supreme Lord, but they were attracted to the Brahman. Not that they, they were saying the Lord doesn't have a form. They didn't say that. They just said, they just spoke about the Brahman. The absolute, the impersonal. But they didn't say that, they didn't deny the form of the Lord. They didn't, even the four Kumaras, they had heard about him from Lord Brahma, but they were attracted to the Brahman. Later on when they met the Lord, when they actually met the Lord, then they were attracted. So there was no offense. If there's an offense, if they actually go out and say, oh, the, the, the Lord is, has no form, the Lord cannot walk, he cannot, then it becomes offensive. They, that's Mayavada. But Brahmagyanis, they don't make offenses. So they go to the platform of Brahman. They are transcendentalists. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, on the same point, like uh, Shankaracharya and many of them, uh, so are they also Brahma Gyanis because they say they also uh, go to this impersonal part, but also they, uh, I'm confused, like they also uh, say that Krishna is Bhagavan, then why don't they accept Bhakti? Like, Who are you talking about? Shankaracharya. Oh, Shankaracharya, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, Shankaracharya, he, he's, a, you know, he said a lot of different things, you know. At one point he was okay, but then he, <laughs> some points he, go, he goes off. Uh, so the people who follow Shankaracharya, generally they're, you know, they're all Advaitis. They just speak about the oneness. So they don't speak about bhakti. So are they blasphemies, Maharaj? Are they considered by blasphemies? Well, no. It depends. Some may blaspheme, some may not. You have to hear what they say. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Maharaj. laughs> Yes. But the, you, you, uh, I got the point you had made, very brilliant point on, like, um, uh, we have to know what they are saying and uh, not necessarily everybody blasphemes the Lord and if they are only going through the impersonal path and knowing, uh, they, they talk only about that part, but they, you know, uh, they, they, they don't talk necessarily about the path. Right, yeah. Mm. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Okay, so we will stop here. We have to finish tomorrow. We'll okay. finish the chapter. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Yes.